The Holy Gospel according to John, the fifth chapter. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. I tell you the truth. A time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to live, and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. By myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. If I testify about myself, my testimony is not valid. There is another who testifies in my favor, and I know that his testimony about me is valid. You have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. Not that I accept human testimony, but I mention it that you might be saved. John was a lamp that burned and gave light, and you chose for a time to enjoy his light. I have testimony weightier than that of John, for the very work that the Father has given me to finish and which I am doing, testifies that the Father has sent me, and the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You have never heard his voice or seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. You diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. I do not accept praise from men, but I know you. I know that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not accept me. But if someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. How can you believe if you accept praise from one another, yet make no effort to obtain the praise that comes from the only God? But do not think, I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom your hopes are set. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? The Gospel of the Lord. Well, grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is indeed the Christ, the Anointed One of God, and let us pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the day that you've given to us, a day that you have made. We rejoice in it. We rejoice in you and we praise you. You are worthy of all honor and glory and praise. We thank you for this word that we have to meditate upon from John chapter 5. We pray, O oh Lord, that we would understand it. To understand it, Lord, we need your Holy Spirit. And so we pray, Holy Spirit, come, lead us in the truth. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are continuing with John chapter 5. Just to give you an idea as to where we are in this particular chapter, this is the chapter that Jesus had gone to the pool of Siloam, and he had um, healed the man who had been an invalid for 38 years. He'd been laying at that pool for 38 years, and the Lord went up to him and said, do you want to get well? The man actually didn't answer Jesus, and Jesus did finally say, get up, take up your mat, and go. That was all great, fine, and dandy for the man. He got up, took up his mat, and went, but it was on the Sabbath. And so the Pharisees were pretty bent out of shape about the fact that Jesus was healing on the Sabbath. One of the things that we're going to hear in today's uh, message, and you've already heard it, but we'll hear it again, is that Jesus does what his father does. So when he was healing on the Sabbath, even though it broke the traditions of men, Jesus was completely in accord with what his father wanted him to do. 
So we start at verse 24 and we hear these words, I tell you the truth, said Jesus, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and he will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. This verse isn't really any different than John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. He's saying here, whoever hears my word, whoever believes my word, he's not simply believing my word alone, he's believing the one that sent me. And if he believes or she believes the one who sent me, that one has eternal life. They have crossed over from death to life. We have all been born into spiritual darkness and spiritual death, but when we come to, to faith in Jesus, we cross over from spiritual death Spiritual life is where we now are. Faith is the assurance that God has done all of this for us through Jesus. We are told in the scriptures, and we need to understand this, that you know when Jesus was talking to these Pharisees, he was really wanting to let them know they were in opposition to him because he was breaking the traditions of men. But he really wanted them to know that whenever they heard the word of truth, they needed to respond. There's a scripture passage from 1 Corinthians where Paul says, now is the time of God's favor, now is the day of salvation. When Jesus spoke those words to those particular Pharisees, he was saying, now is the time. Cross over now from death to life. The Son is doing what the Father wants him to do. Believe. Believe. He continues with verse 25. He says, I tell you the truth, a time is coming and has now come. When the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. What he is talking about there is what I've already mentioned. The dead being the spiritually dead. That's where all of us begin. Thanks to Adam and Eve. We all begin spiritually dead. We all have no way of moving from spiritual death to spiritual life except through faith in Jesus. Except that the Holy Spirit work a work of faith in us and creates the ability for us to believe this good news. Jesus is saying to them, it is the truth. The time has now come when the spiritually dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Unfortunately, not everybody hears the voice of the Son of God. Not everybody accepts the voice of the Son of God. You see, being born spiritually dead, we have within us the ability to resist the work that God wants to be doing in our lives. See, God never condemns anybody to eternal separation from him. That's a choice that people make because they themselves have resisted hearing the voice of the Lord. But he says, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of God and those who hear will live. He goes on to say, for the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. We understand from Scripture, that God has no beginning and no end. He has life in himself. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, together, one God. But Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they all have life in themselves because there is only one God. But the three persons, they are co-equal. They are all uncreated. They all have life in themselves. But God has given the Son the authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. What's interesting is that it is the exact same word that brings life, spiritual life, 
that also is responsible for the spiritual death of people or the continuing spiritual death of people. Because it's in how we respond to the word. The word of life is spoken. If it is rejected, it leads to spiritual death or continued spiritual death. Continued separation from God. If it's received, however, then it leads to spiritual life. Throughout this text, it's interesting, there are three doublets. What do I mean by that? Well, Jesus speaks of those who believe and those who don't believe. He speaks of those who honor the Son and those who do not honor the Son. He speaks of those who receive life and those who reject salvation, reject life. You see, there is only one choice, for Jesus or against Jesus. For Jesus or against Jesus. To believe or not to believe, to honor the Son or not honor the Son, to receive life or not to receive life. He is speaking to those people, those Pharisees, who do not want to have anything to do with him. He's telling them about that situation where that man was healed after 38 years. He's saying, don't be amazed at this. What he's actually saying is, this is just the beginning of all the wonderful things that God is going to do on earth. Because the Son of Man has come and done the work that God gave to him to do. He says, don't be astonished. Don't just sit there and go, oh, isn't that pretty awesome? He says, take the next step to believe. Take the next step. Do not stay where you are. Move forward in faith. I mean, plenty of people can just scratch their head and go, hmm, that's an interesting thing to be happening. He's saying, go beyond that. Go beyond that. Don't be amazed at this, he says, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves, now he is talking about the physically dead. He started out with those that were spiritually dead. Now he's talking about the physically dead. Those who are in their graves, those who are physically dead, will hear his voice and come out. He's talking about the resurrection of the dead in the last day. He says, those who have done good will rise to live. And those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. And we sit there and go, what is this about being good and being evil and all this sort of stuff? We, we thought it was all about, by faith you are saved through grace. It's not about works. He's not talking about works saving people. He's talking about works following the believer. That's what he's talking about. Those who have done good. To do good in God's eyes is to believe the one he sent. That's what doing good is, but then good works will follow those who believe. Those, however, who reject the Son, even the evil deeds that they do follow them as well right on into judgment and eternal damnation. Now, Jesus again goes on to talk about judgment. He says, by myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but to please him who sent me. Jesus didn't do anything to please himself. He wasn't a free agent, as we think of free agents. He was not independent of the Father. He was totally interdependent. The Godhead is totally interdependent. It is totally one. So what Jesus was doing, he was doing everything the Father had assigned him to do, and he was here to complete the work the Father had given to him, and he came only to please the Father. Remember, he did it all so that we could see the Father. That's how he could then tell Philip, at the end, have I been with you so long, Philip, and yet you do not know me? Those who have seen me have seen the Father. He was a perfect representative of the Father. He represented him 100%. 
Then, when we get to verse 31, Jesus starts talking about testimonies. Testimonies that will be, uh, well, a testimony is a witness, and so the witnesses that would point to him. He says, if I witness about myself, he says, my testimony is not valid. In the Jewish culture, it was on the word of two or three witnesses that something is established. Two or three witnesses outside of the person that was, you know, you know, being on the defense. So Jesus, even though he was absolutely speaking the truth, he was also saying there are other witnesses besides myself. He says, there is another who testifies in my favor, and I know that his testimony about me is valid. Eventually, Holy Spirit will be one who testifies, but this one, he is speaking about the Father. He says, I know that his testimony is absolutely valid. The Father puts his stamp of approval on the Son, testifies, witnesses to the Son. He says, you are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. But then Jesus goes on to say, you, you people here, you Pharisees, you sent to John, you wanted to hear what he had to say. John was indeed a a person to testify to me, or may a witness be a witness to me. But John was a human witness. He was a valid witness. He was certainly a, a true witness of the Lord Jesus, but he was a human witness. So, as wonderful as that is, there was even a greater witness than John. And he starts to talk about the fact that there were these other witnesses. The weightier witnesses, the ones that had the most validity, John, Jesus now talks about. He says, the very work that the Father has given me to finish and which I am doing testifies the Father has sent me. So he says, the work I'm doing. Look at the work I'm doing. What was he doing? He was proclaiming that the kingdom of God was at hand. And then he showed the kingdom of God through what he did. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He cast out demons. He cleansed lepers. He made the lame to walk, the blind to see, the deaf to hear, the mute to speak, and more. So he spoke the word of God and he demonstrated the word of God. So he said the very work is a witness. Then he said the father who sent me has himself testified concerning him. The father did it through the word. The word of God testifies from one end of the book to the other, from Genesis to Revelation, that Jesus is the Christ of God. We heard that in our psalm this morning. We heard a witness that it was going to be God who was going to redeem Israel from all their sins. In verse 8 of Psalm 30, or verse 7, it says, O Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. He himself. Not somebody else. God himself would be the one to redeem the world. Jesus here, when he says, The Father who sent me himself testifies concerning me. He goes on to say, you have never heard his voice nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. Remember, he's talking to those Pharisees that were complaining about the fact that he healed a man who had been an invalid for 38 years because he healed on the Sabbath. That's why Jesus could say, his word does not abide in you. Because, see, they were rejecting what they were seeing with their own eyes. 
He goes on to say, you diligently study the scriptures because you think by them you possess eternal life. And he says, but the scriptures are testifying about me. He says, I'm standing right here in front of you. Those scriptures are pointing to me. You're studying them and yet you are missing the point because they point to me. The scriptures testify about Jesus. The work Jesus did testified about Jesus. The Father testified about Jesus. The scriptures testified about Jesus. He goes on to say, I do not accept the praise from men, but I know you. I know that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. I've come in my Father's name and you do not accept me, but if somebody comes in their own name, you're going to accept them. He's like, get a clue. Why do you accept the praise of men? But do not go seeking the praise which comes from God. The Pharisees, they were all into the books of Moses. You know, Moses, you know, we're the disciples of Moses. We're the disciples of Moses, they were saying. Jesus goes on to say, I'm not going to be the one that's going to accuse you before the Father. You have put your trust in Moses. He wrote about me. He wrote about me. Already in Genesis chapter 3, when the Lord is speaking to the serpent after the man and the woman sinned, what were the words of Moses? On the lips of God, we hear these words, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. God said already in the beginning that he and not another was going to be the savior of the world. In Deuteronomy, before Moses' death, he said, the Lord is going to raise up a prophet like myself from among you, from among your own brothers, Jesus came out of the tribe of Judah. And Moses was saying already then, listen to him. You must listen to him. We have an interesting account in Genesis. Genesis 18, I believe when Abraham has to rescue Lot. Lot and his family had been the whole area that they lived in, Sodom and Gomorrah and that whole territory. They'd been uh, captured and carried off, and so Abraham went after him. And he, with his 318 men, managed to rout five kings. And so he was able to bring back home everything that these Kings had taken, plundered people, servants, cattle, and so forth. When Abraham had done that, we have an interesting character who shows up, who comes out of the city of Salem. He comes out to Abraham with bread and wine. We find out his name is Melchizedek. And Melchizedek was known as the priest of the Most High God. A foretaste of what was coming. Melchizedek, by the way, means king of righteousness. The king of righteousness came to Abraham with bread and wine. It was a foretaste of the one who truly is the king of righteousness, who himself would become the bread and the wine the body and blood for us, for our salvation. You know, Jesus got on to these characters because he was standing right in front of them. He was doing the work of God, and yet they refused to come to him because he did not fit the mold that they thought he should fit. God doesn't fit in molds. 
God doesn't fit in the boxes that we try to put him in. It behooves us to follow the God of the Bible and the gods that we create in our own minds. He doesn't fit. We've got to take what's in the word of God and we've got to believe what's there. Even if it does not compute with us. God is so much greater than our imaginations. We must believe the word of God. The written word, the incarnate word, Jesus, the spoken words, the words that are given to us. We've got to believe those words far above anything that we can imagine. This is truly an extraordinary text from John chapter 5. I pray that after we leave here today, we would meditate on it further. It's good, meaty. It's good and meaty. That's what I wanted to say. It's good and meaty. It's worth chewing over time and time and time again. And so I pray we will. Amen and amen.